Welcome everyone, welcome to the Simon Dan podcast, episode 34, I hope you're well. Um, it's been a week off, I've had a week off, I've had a nice holiday, nice refreshing holiday, um, although what well, I was just talking with Katz, he'll, he'll know different, but yeah, I have had a little bit of a break, I hope you didn't miss us too much, but he is back, my law co-host, the man who wears an Indiana Jones hat to the soft play centre, it's Katz, how you doing? I'm doing very well. Hang on, Actually, hang on, hang on, you jumped in too early. Oh, before the jingle. It's I'm Katz. How you doing, mate? You right? <laughs> I'm, right. I'm I'm sorry about that. One you know, week was, off, one week off, and he forgets everything. It's not my sole goal to come and uh, and ruin the start of your podcast, but I managed it, it's even fine. without trying. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Anyway, I've had a week off. I've not really looked at anything. Anything happening big in in Flat Earth World this this week? Uh, no, I've uh, I've not looked myself to be honest. So um, although we did we did get a good education from Bob the Science Guy on how sextants uh, work ah, and yeah. I what, need to catch what up they would look that. like on a flat Earth, which yeah. was interesting. Yeah, because someone was trying to prove it as flat Earth proof, weren't they? Use it as flat Earth proof. <laughs> they, they were, funny yeah. enough. Yeah, <laughs> but he, he, yeah, Bob the Science Guy coming out to chat with us and he give a, a, a really good thorough uh, rundown of how they work. That was interesting. Excellent, excellent. Right, let's crack on. Get our guest on. Joining us this week is an astronomer, writer, science communicator and presenter, former president of the James Randi Educational Foundation. It's the bad astronomer himself, Philip Plate. How are you doing? Howdy. Thanks for having me on. No, oh, it's absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming on. Uh, so, Phil, I know you. It's, your voice is synonymous to me with crash course astronomy. We had Dr. Shinny Samara on a few weeks ago who did the physics and engineering version. You presented the astronomy version Again, extremely well made and absolutely packed with info, just like the physics ones. How was that experience? <laughs> uh, it was a lot of work. Yeah, uh, yeah it was a lot of fun. Um, I was familiar. You know, Crash Course is done by uh, Hank and John Green's company, and they have a bunch of really great people working there. Uh, and I, I, you know, seen these videos online. In fact, my daughter was uh, having trouble with uh, significant figures, significant digits okay, yes. in, uh, in math. And, uh, you know, looking up stuff online, trying to figure out how to do it. And we found Hank talking about that on one of the Crash Course episodes. So, you know, I knew about it and everything. Um, and then I was actually at San Diego Comic-Con oh, wow. a few years back. Uh, just doing the nerd thing. And Derek Muller, Ver Veritasium, comes up to me and says, hey, I'm here representing uh, uh, Hank, seeing if you want to do uh, Crash Course Astronomy. And I thought, I, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, but, you know, let me let me talk about it. You know, I talk to my family about it because I got a lot of stuff going on, blah, blah, blah. I came home and said to my wife and daughter, so, so Hank Green wants me to do this. And uh, my daughter's eyes went whoop, got yeah. really big. And I was like, oh, maybe I should do this. And it turns out Derek had just been talking to Hank and they were talking about doing astronomy and they're like, who should we have? And that's why they asked me. And um, it, it was you know, at that point, it was uh, talking about how we wanted to do it and writing out sort of a syllabus and then getting that okayed and then writing, writing, writing each yeah. one. Yeah. You know, it's it, it like eight minutes or something. Uh, and then, you know, I'd flap to Montana, film them, had a great time. The company, you know, I'm going to interrupt myself there. I am an, an old cynical jerk sometimes, <laughs> you know, the black heartened. Yeah. I've seen this world now. I've tried to make it better. I've been kicked in the teeth every time. Uh, and then I get up to Montana where we're filming this with all these people. And it was like all of these people, they're younger than me. Um, they're go-getters. They're smart. They, they just, they shine brightly. It's the only way I can describe them, all these people and they want to make the world better. Yeah. And they honestly, they're, they're like, they're, they're millennials, right? They're snarking, but they're, they're like at their, their, their heart and their souls. They want to make the world a better place. And so making crash course as much work as it was and as hard as it was, was an absolute joy working with these folks. And now Heck, you know, all, I got, what is it? 46 episodes. I can even remember. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, yeah, they're all online. They're all on YouTube. They have a gazillion views. I get email about them and people talking to me on social media saying, Hey, I love this. And it's, it's terrific. I mean, it's like, if this is the, if this is a thing I'm remembered for, uh, I'm okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you've seen them cats, but I gen so cats has taught quite a bit of astronomy. Uh, did you do a level in the end cats? No, um, just, GCSE. Just, um, just GCSE. I, I genuinely yeah. believe that with that 
with that crash course astronomy uh, set of videos, you could pass uh, possibly an A-level astronomy uh, paper because they're that well done and they've got that much info in. Um, oh, thank you. I genuinely believe you could just go through the whole set of videos and probably pass a, a paper with a bit of revision, of course, as well. But they are, I mean, all of them are brilliant. As I said to Dr. Shini Samara as well, the physics ones are great and, uh, and the engineering ones as well. Um, oh, but let's, let's I take wish, a- I almost wish I could update them. You know, yeah. I talked about this with Hank. It's like, you know, every, every couple of years you can go back and look at these and go, yep, that's wrong. Yeah. That's yeah. wrong. Because, yeah. you, you know, things change. Our ideas. Course, yeah. I don't even have an episode on Pluto because literally as we were filming those, as we were recording those episodes, um, the new horizons probe was like months away yeah. from, from passing by Pluto. And I thought anything I say, is going to be wrong. Yeah. So I, I just talked about, and, and it's like, I, I already think of Pluto as like the largest of these icy, rocky objects out there. So I just talked about them in general. Um, and then, you know, we found out all, all the stuff about Pluto less than a year later. And I was like, Oh God, I'd love to go back. And what, an episode, episode, what an episode. What an episode that'd be. Yeah. Yeah. Like gravitational lens and all, just all this <laughs> stuff that's out there that we just didn't have time to do. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a, it's a bit, it's an ever changing, uh, an ever changing science astronomy, isn't it? Um, Let's take a step back, though, a, a track, track back. You spent a lot of time working with the Hubble Space Telescope, didn't you, at NASA? What started you off on that journey? Yeah, that was a 10-year t- off and on sort of a thing. Um, <laughs> what started it? What started it was looking at a telescope at, through a telescope at Saturn when I was like five years old. Um, yeah. If you want to go back that far. Um, uh, I don't want to do the whole Carl Sagan, you know, to create a universe, <laughs> yeah. to create a, to make an apple make pie from apple scratch, pie. you have yeah. to create yeah. a universe. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, yeah, well, I started working on Hubble 13.8 billion years ago in the big bang. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I've just, I've loved astronomy all my life and um, got into grad school, uh, university of Virginia, started doing some research for my master's degree, but I was struggling actually trying to find a PhD research when my master's degree stuff was winding up. Um, and then uh, almost at the last minute, I mean, I was about ready to leave. And uh, one of the professors said, well, I've got this thing coming up on Hubble and Hubble hadn't launched yet. Okay. So this was like early April, 1990 and Hubble was literally going to be launching like three, two, two, three weeks later. And I was like, yes, I want to work on a project with Hubble observations. So I like got all this, all these books and everything. And the internet wasn't that great. So, you know, we have these binders full of documents and all of a sudden I'm boning up on it, reading everything. And then they launched it and it was great. And our observations were some of the first ones done yeah. and we got them. And I was like looking at them thinking, well, this, this isn't, something's wrong. Uh, and after about two days, I'm like, yeah, these aren't focused. I, I thought maybe <laughs> I was doing something wrong or whatever. And then for the next two years, you know, it was like, well, now I get to work on images that are out of focus. For those of you who don't know, Hubble was launched with a slightly flawed mirror uh, and it was out of focus. Uh, and so these early images were a nightmare to work with. Yeah, I bet. i tell you. But I eventually got my PhD. Um, Hubble got uh, upgraded and, and you know, quote unquote fixed. Uh, it works great. I, I just worked on a, on a different project for a few months after I got my degree. That one was already winding down when I got the job. Uh, and like six months later, I was looking for a job again and then found one on a new camera they were putting on Hubble nice. called a Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph. And they said, we need somebody who knows how to program in this language and is familiar with Hubble and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, this is a checklist of all the stuff I've done. Yeah. So I got the job and for the next six years, I guess, something like that, uh, worked on this Hubble camera and it was amazing. I mean, it was being built and then we launched it and it worked, uh, it shorted out some years later and then they went up and fixed it and uh, it's still up there doing its thing. And it's awesome. just kind of amazing to, when the images come down from that particular camera and I'm like, I worked you on were that. There. Yeah. 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 Really cool. Uh, were, you, were you there when they, t- the, fa- the famous deep field view, were you there for that one? Um, now let's see. I don't remember when the first deep field was, was put out, but yeah, I mean, it, I wasn't working on that. But, you know, I was around for it. And yeah. in fact, they followed up with several different deep fields. And this is where they took Hubble and basically pointed it at a quote unquote blank area of the yeah. sky. Yeah. Just like the least interesting non-star filled spot in the sky. And I think the first one was somewhere near the Big Dipper. And um, yeah, and it, it, it sees thousands of galaxies. Yeah. It stared at this spot for like a week or something like that. Uh, and it can, as it's doing that, it just sees fainter and fainter objects. 
Well, over the years, they said, you know, we need to do this again. And so they followed up and it turns out um, they looked in the southern hemisphere with a different camera. And at the same time that that camera was taking pictures, our camera was as well. I didn't work directly on those images, but I played with them for a while just to see if there was anything in them or anything I could do. And so it was actually pretty amazing to like just sit there for a day on my on my computer I thinking, <laughs> you know, look at this. This is like one of the deepest, if not the deepest yeah. image ever taken on our camera because our camera was so sensitive. Uh, so that was, yeah, that was phenomenal. Look at these galaxies and think, yeah, some of these things are 10 billion light years away. They yeah. existed when the universe was only a few hundred million years old. And yeah, it's impossible to not get the hair on the back of your oh, neck stand up. I, I was going to say, uh, this is an incredible photo. They're, they're, those sets of photos are incredible photos. And I've, I've witnessed people see them for the first time and you can literally see inside their head it blow because they just can't fathom how such a small patch of sky can have so much stuff in it that we don't actually see right. normally. This is a, a, an area of the sky that's similar to holding a grain of sand on yeah. your fingertip. Amazing. And then extending that out arm's length. And, you know, that's how much of the sky you're blocking. And yet it's filled with galaxies. Okay. And then you can say, well, you know, if, if this is a typical region of the sky and it has 10,000 galaxies in it, you can multiply that by how many of those observations you could make over the whole sky. And you realize, yeah, there's something like you know, several hundred billion galaxies that Hubble can see. And it turns out, and now we think there are about 2 trillion galaxies yeah, in the, observ- gonna say, in the observable a, universe, big number. which is staggering, yeah. staggering. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, incredible numbers. Absolutely incredible. Um, and of course, bad astronomy sort of came out roughly the same time, didn't it? And this is where you were correcting some misconceptions about space and astronomy in general. What gave you the idea for that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was in grad school and I want to say it was in 1993. Okay. Um, and a couple of things happened. Um, one was uh, I was watching the local news and they were standing eggs on end on the March equinox. And this is a, an old legend. It's been around since actually around the, like the forties that the only time you can stand an egg on end is at the moment of the equinox or okay. and there are variations on this. And it's actually really hard to find this legend anymore. It used to be everywhere. They would do it on the news, magazines. I, I saw it, videos all, all, all over the place. Uh, and I debunked it. I just, I, I put together a, 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 a web page. Yeah. You know, this was really, <laughs> really early on in the yeah. days of the web. Like, you know, I, I had this terrible URL. It was a uva.edu slash blah, 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 blah. <laughs> uh, and it was just really awful. Um, but, but it was like really early on. And I thought that was fun. And then I saw something on the news later. They were misunderstanding what a shuttle launch and what it was trying to do. And it was kind of embarrassing. The newscasters were kind of laughing at their own ignorance. And I thought, well, you shouldn't be doing that. You're, you're, Oh, look how, look how we don't understand this complicated science. And it's like, this really wasn't complicated science. You guys just don't understand it. Yeah. So yeah. I, I realized at this point that talking about misconceptions and bad ideas and stuff in science is something that I could do. Uh, and, and it's evolved over the years. I used to be fairly mean spirited about it. Now I'm a little bit better until it's something like, you know, I've been saying for years, look, th- these ideas that, you know, people don't believe that the moon landings are real or they believe in UFOs or astrology or whatever. Um, any one of these things is kind of harmless by itself, but put together, this is a mindset of disbelieving science, disbelieving evidence, believing in conspiracy theories yeah. uh, and, and a, a sort of uh believing people who belong to your group, whatever that group might be. And, and this is bad. This is very bad. Uh, and it, this can grow and, and, and become life threatening. And everybody's like, Oh, you're being hyperbolic and exaggerating it. And now look, look yeah. around oh, you. No. Yeah. <laughs> people are taking horse yeah. dewormers for a virus. <laughs> oh my God. So um, yeah, I was exactly right. I hate being right all the time. Uh, but tough. you know, in this case, here you go. Well, cats and I are just a very small portion of the amount of people out there now who combat this stuff on YouTube. Uh, there's yeah, so many, many of us. There's so many of us. And but I'm always funny. You mentioned that I'm very skeptical about the the things like where you mentioned the egg. Someone once told me that you could put, you could put as much pressure as possible, as much force as possible on the two ends of an egg, and it won't break. And I did it once. Yeah. I did it once in a. How'd super- that go for you? Yeah, I did it once in a supermarket, and it went everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember yeah, running. It's, if, if you hold it in your hand, like, um, like you're gripping 
uh, a cricket bat, I suppose. Okay. Uh, for you, for you folks in the UK, um, I, I hate cricket. Squeeze on it. It actually can be if you apply pressure all the way around it. Ah, okay. It can be really hard to crack it. Okay. Uh, it's only when there's like pressure added on one spot that it'll it'll crack and break. But it's not like unlimited. If you, you squeeze it hard enough, yeah, it's going to yeah. go. Yeah, I found that uh, out. Yeah, I found that there, out. There are a million legends like that. And, yeah. and you know, this stuff starts small, but you never know what's going to be the next big thing. And I'm glad you guys are out there doing it because heaven knows I got burned down on it years ago. Just <laughs> well, couldn't, couldn't we're not quite it. there yet. We're not quite there yet. Um, well, that will happen. Yeah, I no, know. You, you I, know. know. You, I hope not. It's just that after a while, it, 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 these things come and go like the, the idea that the moon landings are fake. It's not that big a deal anymore. Um, there are people out, there's always going to be some, some amount of people in the noise who are going to believe it statistically speaking. Yeah. And you'll probably find the same thing with the flat earthers. They're going to kind of go away once they're, you know, once the sun sets on, on their disc shaped planet or whatever yeah. the hell shape they yeah. think it is. We'll, we'll see <laughs> about that. We'll see. I mean, I don't know about you cats, but I, it's obviously important, but I kind of, I enjoy it and it's fun as well, isn't it? It, it is, it is, it is fun. Um, yeah, you know, maybe it shouldn't be, maybe, it should, you know, but uh, I can't, I can't help. Just, you just can't help at the, the ridiculousness of some of the claims that they make and the way they try and justify it. I think that's the, that, that's yeah. the, that's the interesting bit. That's what makes it funny. It's how, how have they come to actually believe, for example, that, you know, the Rayleigh criterion is the reason boats vanish bottom up. You know? Yeah, it's it's very. Uh, it, there's a, there's so much of that though, isn't there? There's so much of them making their own stuff up. Um, I, I kind of enjoy it as like like solving a puzzle, right? Somebody says, uh, "How do you explain this?" And they show you some weird thing in an image, and you're like, "Well, I don't know off the top of my head." So I'll dig into it a little bit, and then you find out whatever it's a copy of a copy of a copy uh or or you don't expect the shadows to work the way that they're claiming uh and, and what you find out is after a while you start to see the pattern of like they're telling you 90 percent of the information you need to understand what's really going on but that 10 percent is the key part that they're not talking about and you say mm -hmm. yeah but this and then everybody goes oh right of course this is wrong and yeah. uh, so it, it's it's if you treat it like a brain teaser and once you learn how to solve those kind of problems, it becomes useful in everyday life because you, it, it helps you solve problems around you. Yeah. Well, uh, as long as you ignore the larger impact of the fact that you're surrounded by conspiracy theorists who believe in this that's stuff. A, that's a really good way of looking at it, actually. <laughs> Um, yeah. that, that and the bad astronomy stuff that sort of morphed into the the bad universe TV pro program, didn't it? Was was that as much fun to make as it looked? Because it looked brilliant. Oh, thank you. Um, it yeah it. it my first book was called bad astronomy. And then the second book was death from the skies. And it was definitely weirdly, even though it's called bad universe, it's, it's based on death from the skies, which just all the ways astronomical uh, events could possibly yes. hurt us here on earth. Um, and, you know, asteroid impacts, solar flares, those are really the only two ones that have a decent chance of happening, but black holes passing by and all that stuff. So yeah, I got uh, optioned for a, for a, a show and we made a three part kind of a pilot, series for discovery it wasn't picked up um but uh, you know uh, filming a lot of it was hard because it involved you know living in the desert for days and yeah. days and days on end and uh living in in seedy motels and, and eating fast food constantly but the the crew was great uh we did a lot we blew stuff up i mean we, we detonated gosh what was it three thousand pounds of uh anfo wow. ammonium nitrate fuel yeah. fuel oil mix uh, and made a huge hole in the desert to talk about asteroid impact. Got to meet a lot of really interesting people. Uh, so yeah, and and, um, and and you know they paid me, so that was that <laughs> was good too. I could afford to eat for for a few months after that. So um, I'd love to do something like it again. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, I, I I I just telling you guys earlier, I pulled a muscle in my back this morning, just basically existing. <laughs> so I'm not sure that. Uh, at my age, my advanced age, yeah. the crawling through uh, caves in the desert, or or all that kind of stuff, or flying in a jet, which I did in an air, in a in, a, in the Thunderbirds high performance in F sixteen, that was uh, terrifying. Yeah, and I don't want to do that again. Yeah, um, but it was exhilarating while it was going on. Well, it certainly looked a lot of fun. Uh, definitely. Um, so yeah, in one episode, you talk about how stars die, what would happen if a planet got in the way, and all, and that sort of thing. I guess from death from above, sort of thing. When I speak to the general public or friends or family about that sort of thing, most people still think that all stars die with a supernova by blowing up. Now, I think Katz will agree with me when, he, when I say that astronomy is not very well taught at an intermediate level in school. 
I'm not sure what the science scene in America is, but why is it so often overlooked as a core subject? Um, you're, you're right in that it's typically not taught terribly well. Um, bits and pieces of it are taught in, in the United States. I, I can't speak for uh, in the UK, but in the US we have um, these, these national standards and state standards yeah. where um, there's a list. Like when you're at, at this level, like eighth grade, which is when you're about 13 years old, something like that. Um, you have to know concepts like the electromagnetic spectrum and this and that and, and Newton's laws. But there's not really uh, an astronomy standard uh, as such. So it's not like you're typically going to school and getting taught astronomy. I, and I can understand that. You know, there's a lot going on in school and there's a lot of topics to learn. Uh, a lot of math, a lot of science, a lot of you know, music, English, uh, all of this stuff, history. So um, I get it. Uh, you can't teach everything. You can't teach biology and geology. You can only get snippets of it. So sure. I get that. Yeah. Um, and if people don't understand that uh, not all stars explode, that's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, it's something they can learn online or it's, it's not necessary for them to live, live their lives. On the other hand, um, knowing, for example, that the iron in your blood, the calcium in your bones, the gold in your jewelry, uh, and, and like basically every single part of your computer and phone um, exist because of different stars that died in different ways. Yeah. Um, that I think, uh, you know, it's not life or death. On the other hand, that's awesome yeah. and yeah. makes your life better. Yeah. I think just knowing that the universe is that cool. Yeah. And the more you learn of stuff like that, I think the more curious people become uh, about that specifically, like, you know, I never thought, why does the moon always show one face to the earth? You know, why do stars rise and set, whatever. And uh, from there, you can lead to just a, 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 a love of being curious. And I don't care if that curiosity is astronomy or music, or I watched a bunch of TikTok videos about grammar and etymology yesterday uh, because it was fascinating. Yeah. Um, and, and for me, as long as you're curious, as long as you want to learn about what's going on around you, that's a good thing. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. And I guess what I'm trying to, I guess what I'm thinking is, I, I don't know, especially in the UK anyway, astronomy, the, the small part of astronomy that is taught is, is in, in with physics, isn't it, Katz? Um, yeah, there is. Uh, a specific GCSE in astronomy, though, or yeah, which but it's is, not which like is, a, it, it's selective, isn't it? You don't, you don't have, you don't always yeah, it's do not it. core. Yeah. You've got to opt for it. Yeah, and I think the reason a lot of people don't, a lot of schools don't. We did, and I've taught it, and I loved teaching it. It was great. But I think the problem is, you know, kids go to school during the daytime. Um, yeah. So the, the kind of practical side of it, you you can't do really. You know, maybe the bits with the solar telescopes, etc. So it becomes very, very uh, theory based, which it should be because there's a lot of that interesting yeah. stuff. But you know, the, the kids want to get a bit more hands on, and they can't in the day. Well, I went to a school and I taught a school where there was no option to do GCSE astronomy at all. You know, they couldn't even select it. Uh. So um, it, that's the what I'm getting at. Kind of, I think it should just be available mm. if you want to do it. Yeah. And you can do astronomy during the day if you have access to telescopes on the other side of the planet. Of course, yes. Because, yeah. you know, we do live on a round planet from what I've heard. Oh, well, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so if it's day where you are, it's night someplace else. Yeah. And there are robotic telescopes that are hooked up to the internet. Um, back, I, I worked for a little while actually developing educational materials. Um, this is after I worked on Hubble. And um, we actually started thinking about how to do this. And this was early on when it was still really hard to do this, to get telescopes online. Now, heck, you can buy them uh, and, and, or have, you know, partner with somebody in Australia or wherever and um, have a, you can have a network of telescopes that are observing 24 hours a day. And uh, they're, they're, I don't think this actually exists, but I mean, you could feasibly do this and just have nothing but a streaming astronomy channel where it's just live shots of whatever people are observing. That would be amazing. That would yeah. actually be a great idea. I'm stealing yeah, it. Yeah, you heard it here first. I'm stealing it. Um, <laughs> right, we're going to have a short break. Uh, we're going to do what we call Cat's Curiosity, and this is where Cat's brings us a piece of science news that has interested him over the last week, uh, and then we're going to have a chat about it. What have you got, mate? Well, this week, um, if you remember last time out, I found a headline that was was quite a catchy headline, quite a clickbait headline, which really misrepresented the story. Yes. <clears throat> and I've seen another one. 
Okay. Um, that's what Twitter's for. And the headline uh, was, it accompanied a picture of factory workers, we're all up in arms, um, with signs saying elephants have taken our jobs. So, of course, <laughs> I clicked on that. Uh, it took me <laughs> to the following story, which, having dug a little bit deeper, um, you can get in full on the CNN uh, website in America, but it's only a couple of days old. So there is a project, um, and I, I've got to make sure I pronounce this right. It's, it's an EU-backed project called the Proboscis Project, and it's all about elephant trunks and how um, they can be used as inspiration for creating robots to do particular jobs. So it turns out elephant trunks are very strong. Obviously, they can pick up about 600 pounds, but they can also be extremely delicate. So you could give them, um, you know, like a, a you know very brittle piece of glass or, you know, glass yeah. straw or something like that, and they can pick that up without cracking it. Um, light things, they pick up through suction, and then the heavier things, they'll, they'll initially use suction to get it in place and then wrap the trunk around it. Um, and people that are or these, these companies that want to make robots do particular jobs, it's obviously in their interest that they have jobs that can perform a multitude of tasks, deal with heavy things and light things, rather than have to buy lots of different robots. So the idea is for this proboscis project that they're going to, um, or that they are studying elephants to try and basically build elephant trunks, um, artificial elephant trunks that, yeah. can, that can perform more variety of jobs. So what they've done is they've taken an elephant and they've done, like you might do when you're doing CGI stuff for a superhero film, they've put stop motion yeah. um, markers on the trunk yeah. and they've, yeah. they've analyzed the way the trunk moves and they've determined that an elephant trunk apparently moves in 20 different ways. That's it. 20 different ways um, where the parts can either elongate or they can contract. But when they combine all the different ways that those 20 different ways can go together, the elephant trunk is, is unbelievably uh, versatile. Um, so they're trying to model the, the robots on that, and they found a way also to 3D print tissue that behaves like elephant skin. Um, so then these products can then be used in, in factories, et cetera, uh, as like a, just like an incredibly versatile robot. So it was quite an interesting story to read. Um, and there you go. And, and, and the headline was elephants are taking our jobs. But, yeah, because the factory workers <laughs> yeah. uh, were going to be our yeah. job. Yeah, that's it. Wow. So nothing I, to do with the science. I cannot believe that. I cannot believe it. What, the headline? No, that the, the, they're able to produce that. It, it's quite incredible. It's quite incredible. I was, it was really interesting, but it's on the CNN website, the actual proper article not yeah. the uh, the one that i originally found um and it's really quite interesting the, the research they've, they've done into it um yeah. so you can find it on there what do, you, what do you think of that phil you heard that before i assumed that the factory workers were being paid to eat peanuts uh <laughs> so that was you know, clearly what the headline was referring to that's really that's really cool and you know people always i i, I love the headlines too where where they're like scientists have been trying to do this for decades but you know nature invented this a long time ago and it's like well, yeah, nature's also had like 4 billion years to yeah. develop, yeah. you know, a, a several trillion ways that don't work and, and this one way that does. Uh, and, and the evolutionary pressures are, are pretty high for that kind of thing. So uh, it's not a surprise that, um, you know, we're still we're just now figuring out how to mimic these amazing machines that nature has evolved. Well, naturally, uh, and that that's really cool. And, and it's it's hard. Um, a lot of our a lot of our senses are logarithmic and this is an issue. It's, it's, it's like you said, if you want to pick up something delicate, but also lift something heavy, there's a range of pressure. You have to be able to apply very delicate and very hard. Mm. And if you try to scale that linearly, literally applying twice as much pressure here or five times, it's hard. You, you, it's hard to get that, that range you need. Uh, and our eyes work the same way. We don't respond to light like if something's twice as bright, it doesn't look twice as bright to us. So, you know, you learn logarithms in school and it's like, when will I ever need to know this? And it's like, your eyes do this every second of every day. And it's a problem because it's hard to observe really faint objects and really bright objects with the same camera. And that's a real problem in astronomy. If we could mimic the eye better, yeah. that would be a revolution. So I, I love that people are studying this kind of thing because it's, it's important and it's going to have huge impact in, in the industrial side of all the science we're trying to do. It's awesome, but we're we're one step away from a a fleet of Terminator elephants from the future, aren't we? <laughs> I love this idea. <laughs> Just got to be careful where you stick the trunk. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's let's not beat around the bush. We talked about flat earthers a little bit. Have you had any run-ins with them? 
You know, I've been pretty lucky. Uh, I have not. Um, it may be that I've I've already blocked so many people who believe that the Apollo landings are fake. That that you know that Venn diagram with flat Earthers is a circle. So uh, I don't hear from them too much. And if I do, I probably just block them reflexively without even thinking twice. Um, but I assume you guys uh, you guys hear from them all the time. Oh yeah, we we uh, Katz is a a master debater, aren't you, Katz, uh, with, with the flat Earthers? <laughs> Uh, I, I, well, I, I mean, you can't really debate a flat earther, but it, no. like we said before, you, you, what you can do is you can show the people on the edge who yeah. are watching yeah. that actually the person who's touting the flat earth doesn't know what they're talking about. Yeah, it's about the audience, and that's what mm. we always say. Sure, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the, I've said that for years. So good. Yeah, the flat earthers themselves are, are, are gone. We, th- we we feel it's the it's the audience mm. that are watching. Um, I, I mean, you said about the moon landing there, and it, the moon landing is a funny one. It seems to be a conspiracy that the everyday person is not too surprised at existing. It's almost a soft conspiracy con- uh, theory and it's tolerable amongst friends and stuff. Why do you think that is? I don't know. Um, I get a lot of questions about sort of the philosophy and the, and the psychology of conspiracy. And I don't, I don't really study that. So I don't, I, I can't opine other than someone who has feet on the ground experience, not sort of research into how the human brain goes off <laughs> yeah. off the path. Um, but in a lot of, in a lot of cases, um, it, it's, it's obvious when you study these things, like I said earlier that, you know, these people are, they're not telling you everything you need to know. A lot of times it's a grift. They, they know that they're lying and, and they're Definitely. trying to write a book or get on TV or whatever. Um, and, and a lot of the times as you watch them talk, as you listen to what they're saying, um, it, it's, if you show somebody a picture of, say, you know, Buzz Aldrin on the moon, and you say, why is it lit this way? Why aren't the shadows pointing the right way? Blah, blah, blah. And if people look at that and go, gosh, that is weird. Uh, and it's because people aren't really used to looking around them. And they don't, they, they don't necessarily think about how lighting works and how, yeah. how shadow length is, is a perspective effect and, and all of this stuff. And so it's, it's fairly easy to get people to at least question the reality of things um, by uh, uh, showing them pictures and not, you know, it, it's, it's like a, it's like a magic trick, except in this case, it's uh, it's uh, toxic magic. Yeah. We, we had a guy, we had a guy called Carl come on the podcast who uh, said he had five images that proved that the moon landing wasn't real. And cats and I, I chatted, wrong. sorry, <laughs> I bet he's wrong. Yeah, Katz, okay. Katz and well, I chatted. What was his him. proof? Uh, it was the sea on the rock and all of those classic. Oh, the ones. sea rock. Yeah, the sea That's rock. That's one that. Oh, it, yeah. It, there's a there's a photo from one of the Apollo missions of a sort of a close up of a rock sitting on the ground, and it's got the letter C on yeah, it. Yeah. Um. This and this is one of those. The, you know, the moon landing hoax people. You can make a list hundreds and hundreds of claims and you can kind of you can kind of categorize them or, or or sort them in order of huh to oh my god are you kidding me yeah. that's the most ridiculous yeah. thing i've ever heard yeah, yeah. um and the sea rock is really at the bottom of this list and and it's amazing to me that people pull this out because you look at this picture and it's like wow this rock has a letter c on it and there was a conspiracy theorist guy named ralph renee some years ago he died a few years back uh, who claimed that clearly this was, oh, and I think Bill Casing was another one, uh, another guy, sort of the father of the moon hoax. Clearly this was a stagehand who had labeled yeah. these props. And it's like, okay. And when you hear that, if you're conspiracy minded, you go, yeah. yeah and if you're logical minded, you go, okay, do stagehands label props? Yeah. The answer is no, they don't. Problem, problem one. And then problem two is when you look at this picture, you realize it's, it's kind of ratty looking and doesn't look as sharp as the other pictures. And you realize this is what I mentioned earlier. This is a copy of a copy of a copy. Somebody took the original images from the moon. You know, it's a negative. It's a piece of film. Yeah. Made a print from it, made a print from that, a print from that. And at some point, a hair got in the, the process and, and left a, a shadow basically on the rock. It's not really there. You look at the original image, you can find that rock. There's no C on it. Yeah. This is something that happened later. And it's, so it's, it's claims like that to just make me want to beat my head against a wall. And that is exactly what we said to this Carl guy. We, we pulled out okay. the original, we pulled out the original photo and said, look, here it is. And he got a bit funny, Excellent. didn't he, saying, oh, we can't zoom into it and see properly. We'd have to get an expert mm. to see or something like that. But he wanted to, his his final thing was he wanted to take NASA to court. 
Yeah. That's, that also kills me too. It's yeah. like, it's a government agency, um, you know, and, and, you know, have fun, have fun with that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I'm glad you guys did that. I mean, one of the things, this is something you learn if there's a, if there's a, an upside to debunking conspiracy theories, it's like go to original sources. Yeah. And, and that will almost immediately throw into the trash can 50% of these claims because what they're doing is they're not looking at an original picture. They found some 200 by 200 pixel JPEG on the web and they're analyzing it like it's from a Hasselblad camera. And it's like, no, no, go to the original and you'll see that this makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, it was a very good, it was a good podcast, wasn't it? Guys? We enjoyed it because it really, really enjoyed that. In one, the yeah. end, I think he was, I don't want to say he was wavering, but he definitely took on board a lot of our points, didn't he? You know what? All credit to him. Yeah. He, you know, he came very convinced, but he was prepared to listen to what we had to say. And yeah, you could see that he was at least questioning the evidence he brought by the end, thinking, yeah. well, maybe I brought some poor stuff here. Yeah. But, oh, but, good on you. But then he did yeah, say, he did say that he'd, he'd come to the conclusion of that it was fake after two days of research, didn't he? So. Which is often the way, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you know, it's, it's good. You can, you can do that sometimes. You can sort of, grab these people by the shoulders and say, you're facing the wrong way. Here's the path. This yeah. is, this is where reality is. And sometimes they will go, huh. And if you can get that little nick, that little dent in their, in their shell, uh, it can grow and they can realize that they've been, you know, they've been led astray. Other times people dig in, uh, oh, yeah, and, and you see that with cults, you see it with, um, uh, sort of ultra religious fervor that the more you try to debunk them, the closer in they draw their, their, their defenses. And, and this happens a lot with uh, doomsday cults when yeah. the doomsday doesn't happen. You know, yeah. we've set a date and then the date comes and goes and no comet impact, no solar explosion, no whatever it was they were predicting. And what happens is most of the people in the cult leave, but the, the, the acolytes, as I call them, the, the close group around the one prophet, they draw in closer and it makes them even stronger in their beliefs. And it's, it's, Difficult. Yeah. Very we see, difficult. We see that a lot. We definitely see that a lot. Um, getting something a bit more current, I was browsing some uh, papers on beliefs and conspiracy theories and misinformation about COVID-19. And there was one particular table that, that uh, I was quite surprised at. So there was a, a general mean score for marks out of 10 for how, how many people out of 10 have a conspiracy belief or misinformation belief. Now, the highest score on the conspiracy belief was the Philippines with 5.83 as a mean score. And the lowest was New Zealand with 3.86. With the misinformation beliefs, it was slightly lower. Philippines with 4.91 and Belgium were the lowest with 2.62. But what really struck me about that was the fact that the lowest score was only just under four. That is surprising. Uh, I, I'm not surprised New Zealand would have the lowest score. No, I wasn't either. They've been, yeah, they've I, been so careful, and and their their uh, um, uh, 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 premier uh, was uh, was talking. You know, it's been very public about this and what they're doing and locking down and everybody doing what they're supposed to do. So I'm not surprised that they can get good information out. It's it's. I wonder what the questions are that they asked. Yes, um, are those listed? That then? Well, I, I couldn't see them. Uh, but the, the the interesting thing about New Zealand was they were bottom for conspiracy beliefs, but they weren't bottom for misinformation beliefs. Right. Uh, that was Belgium. So can you just be wrong? Yeah, that's that's it, really. I mean, the conspiracy is much worse, isn't it, than uh, just having a bit of mis misinformation about something? Because with a conspiracy, right. you're grabbing hold of it, and it's like a it's a thing for you, isn't it? It's something that you're gonna you're going to carry on with. But the misinformation, incidentally, the US was second on the conspiracy beliefs with five, mean score of 5.2. I'm shocked. And I'm shocked it's that low, actually. To be well, honest. But actually, that just goes to show you that basically half the country gets everything right and half the, half the country gets everything wrong, and your mean score is 0. 0.5. Shocking to yeah. me uh, that well, that might happen. The misinformation but, belief was slightly lower, 3.73. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, you know, it's the difference between the M and the D, the misinformation versus the disinformation. And Yes. Um, it, it, you know, I know that ivermectin is 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 poison and it's ridiculous that there's no evidence that it works. And the one paper that was published that started all this was was terrible and was withdrawn. Um, and so that's and, and what you're hearing now is disinformation, not misinformation. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there was a claim about monoclonal antibody therapy. 
And it's like, I don't know anything about this. And, you know, there was a, a, a well-known person in my country pushing for this as well as ivermectin. And I thought in my, my initial reaction is, well, this is probably a terrible therapy because if, if they're putting it, but, you know, so I started reading about it and I haven't actually dug into it very deeply, but it turns out, you know, maybe that, maybe this is a good therapy. Maybe it's not, I don't know. The point is I don't know. Yeah. So for me right now, for me to just dismiss it may be wrong. Um, it's, you know, so I, I've just got to be, and I'm not saying that this therapy works. I know people are going to start emailing me saying, oh, this thing is crap. <laughs> yeah. How are you? And it's like, I, I literally just heard about it yesterday. I just don't know about everything going on with COVID-19 and how to treat it. So um, it's easy to be misinformed or to be, you know, non-informed and then to hear about something, go, well, I don't know anything about this. And then what do you do? Well, you know, in, in general, I trust the, the Centers for Disease Control yeah, in my country, the CDC. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're doctors I know, and I can trust you know what they say as well. And I'm not going to go to some uh, tractor repair supply website that sells farm animal uh, deworming medicine and trust what they're going to say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess the difference between disinformation and misinformation is what you do with that misinformation, isn't it? And how you spread it. Or its intent. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it's it's become very political in this country, where the conservatives, the, yeah. the Republicans, are the ones. Uh, their senators, uh, you know, people that are very high up in our government who are promoting garbage. It's crap and it's killing people. We have people who are running states and running big cities who are promoting not wearing masks, not getting vaccines. Um, this is garbage science, and it's become very political. Uh, and that, for me, is disinformation. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand. <laughs> Uh, you don't want to be too careful. You want, you want to be careful. You don't want to be too, uh, too wild with your, your labels here because there are a lot of right wing radio uh, conservative uh, pundits who are dying because they're not getting the vaccine. And I'm thinking, yeah. well, are they, are they, you know, they really believe this? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if they're making money off this or whatever, but these, these people are clearly people who have the vaccine are not dying of COVID-19 and nearly the numbers unvaccinated people are. You get the vaccine, your body's primed to deal with it. The, the, the virus comes in and you get sick, but you tend not to get hospitalized. If you're unvaccinated, it gets bad. Yeah. And so these, these, these right-wing people who are dying and I keep, th- and I'm, and I think everybody's mocking them and I'm thinking, yes, you know, you, you reap what you, you sow what you reap or you reap what you sow. Um, but on the other hand, it seems like they really believed this. So, it, you know, is that misinformation or disinformation at that point? And um, you just have to be careful in how you label things. I yeah, think absolutely. either way they're wrong and they need to be stopped. Yeah. So. Completely. Incidentally, uh, if anyone listening in the UK, England was just under five, which is just below the United States for conspiracy beliefs. And we were 3.5 for misinformation beliefs. So again, just under the US. So very similar. That doesn't surprise me. Mindsets either. there. Yeah. Um, what do you consider to be the current state of scientific understanding in general when, within the general public? Um, I don't know. That's a really good question. Um, there are a lot of um, surveys done every year about scientific understanding. And honestly, for decades, they've been pr- fairly flat. Uh, like um, when you ask somebody a question like, um, does the earth go around the sun or does the sun go around the earth? Half the people get that wrong. Wow. Uh, and uh, But of the half the people who get it right, half don't know that that takes a year. So you can say one quarter of Americans understand that it takes a year for the earth to go around the sun, um, which is abysmal. Uh, yeah. It should be a lot higher than that. That's just sort of basic information you should know. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, so, but that number hasn't changed much in a long, long time. On the other hand, um, these, the, the type of anti-science thinking that makes people distrust and misunderstand science has never been weaponized as uh, efficiently as recently Um, with the advent of the internet, uh, uh, with the advent of uh, news channels dedicated to misinformation and politicians who now stake their careers on, on lying to the public about climate change, COVID-19 and on and on and on. Um, I fear that those numbers may in, in the past few years have dropped. I'd be very interested to see uh, those kind of surveys done again. I haven't seen any in a while. Yeah, I'd be interested to know that uh, uh, the UK's uh, numbers for that as well. What do you, what do you think, Katz? Uh, what, what sort of the level in schools of understanding that sort of stuff? 
Oh, that's, again, that is a really, really good question. Um, God, I mean, I'm only judging it from a teacher's perspective, aren't I? But it, yeah. it's basic. It is basic, you yeah. know, and I know that, um, you know, the kids that don't go on to A-level, which is, you know, it's a good standard of science A-level, you know, give them 18 months, two years, and they'll have forgotten. They'll, in fact, I'll tell you what, when I when I started my teacher training course, uh, they made us all sit. GCSE questions in sciences that weren't our specialism. Okay. So the physics teachers would have to sit biology and chemistry and the amount of teachers, you know, who were physics specialists who'd forgotten the role of the, the ribosome, for example, or, you know, just basic, basic stuff. Um, so yeah, I think a lot, a lot gets forgotten very, very quickly, doesn't it? Yeah. And I, but I suppose the same in, in all subjects. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know what you did though. You were teaching physics at the time, weren't you? And you went, yeah, I'll, I'll do the biology. Knowing that he's got, <laughs> knowing he's got a degree in biology, yeah, I'll do that one. That's, that's fine. <laughs> well, but that's true, isn't it? But it's it's also this is something I've also been hammering for a long time: is that specific knowledge isn't as critical as yeah. understanding how science is done, sure, uh, and also how not just scientific thinking, but just thinking in general. How do you how do you trust a source? Like I I don't know everything about the ribosome. And honestly, I can't remember what it does off the top of my head. However, I know that I can go online and I can find that information and I know which sites I can kind of sort of trust, yeah. or at mm -hmm. least like I can go to Wikipedia for a lot of things. And, and in astronomy, I know that Wikipedia gets a lot of things right and a lot of things wrong, mm -hmm. but typically in general, if, if I say, what is an exploding star? How does that work? I can go to Wikipedia and read it and go, okay. Um, but uh, uh, I don't have to worry so much about the details. So it, in my opinion, l memorizing a lot of stuff isn't nearly as important as understanding how we came to understand what we understand, where science doesn't understand stuff. It's like, hey, we don't know how this, this thing works, but we're figuring it out and we know all this other stuff. And some of this other stuff may be wrong in detail, uh, but in general, we know that you know, relativity works, that quantum mechanics works, that evolution is, is a real thing. Um, but it's, it's sort of around the edges where, where the scientific knowledge isn't, isn't firm yet that we don't understand everything that's going on. And that's okay. That's how we learn. Yeah, absolutely. There's no, there's no shame in saying we don't, we don't know, is there? At all. No, there should be pride in that. Yeah. If I don't know something, hey, that's something now I can learn about. And that's cool. I can, I get to learn something new. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Spot on. Uh, right, so we're going to finish with a bit of fun. We're going to play the scientist game. Now, uh -oh. this is a game where our guest faces off against cats. Uh, so I'm going to start reading some facts about a scientist in chronological order. And the first person to correctly guess the scientist wins the point. Now, cats is 3-2 down. Uh, he, is it not two apiece? Have no, I, no I, I checked because it was you and versus Robin Ince and he got Einstein after the second clue, didn't he? Did he? Yeah. Three, two, oh so my free, word! He's three-two down, Phil. So if you let so him this win is this, double or even for you. Yeah. If it's three to two and you win, you're even. But if you don't, yeah, you can't. Phil, <laughs> come on, ahead of you. you can't let him. You can't let him because he's he gets a bit cocky about it. So you've got to open the gap here. <laughs> right, let's get the music. Okay, first clue. So anytime, make a guess anytime. First clue: born in England in 1656. Uh, started at Queen's in, College in my field okay go ahead started at Queen's College in 1673 in 1676 sailed with the East India Company to the island of St. Helena no can I guess like guess whenever you want if I'm, if I'm just wrong am I out no no you can keep guessing okay in 16 sorry Go ahead. In 1678, on the return home of that trip, he catalogued celestial latitudes and longitudes of 341 different stars. Ooh, in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, Her uh, Herschel. No. No, not Herschel. Um... Later that year, was elected as a Fellow of the Royal Society. In 1684, he met Isaac Newton and assisted him with his gravitational theory. For crime any sake, I should know who this is. Leibniz. Leibniz. Never got clear. Nope. <laughs> yeah, it's not Leibniz. Um, that was uh, that was calculus. Yeah. In 1686, made the first map of the world that showed the ocean winds. 
Wow, this is a tough one. Yeah, I've been no idea. It is tough, to be fair. I've only got two cl clues left, so you better get it soon. Oh, crap. <laughs> this is embarrassing. Okay. In, in 1705, published a synopsis of the astronomy of comets. Edmund Haley. Edmund Haley. Oh, yeah. he's got it. Katz has got it. He's... Shoot, uh, I was we, opening my mouth when yeah, you said it. We could put it down to internet, but Katz has pulled it out. He's done it. Uh, the okay. last I one. I did not know about the winds. That's I really didn't, interesting. I didn't know that either. Yeah. Uh, so and here that, I am going on about how we should all know about the history of science <laughs> yeah. and all this. And I can't name uh, the, the last Sorry. clue. Well, you should have got it in the last clue. That was in the publication he showed the three observations were indeed the same comet. And this was confirmed yeah. on Christmas Day, 1758, 16 years after his death. Uh, so that would have been an absolute banker. But well done, Katz. Three all. He's pulled it back. Did, did I pronounce his name wrong? Because I always say Haley. I, heard I, you say, say, so I, I say Halley. Halley. I, I say Edmund Halley. I, I believe it's Holly. Oh, there Holly. we go. Three different Holly. pronunciations. There you go. Yeah. So, I'm the one who's not English. So yeah. there you go. Oh, dear. We, we pull rank then and we'll say, uh, we'll say a mixture of ours. Uh, anyway, um, Phil, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, is that chatting it? Just the one? Oh, yeah, crap. just the one. I there were yeah, more. yeah, just the oh, one. It's man. Ev every episode. I would have been on Google what? typing that, that stuff hey, in, trying to get through the cheat. Hey, you, you'll have to tune in next week to see how Cats does on the next one. <laughs> okay. Well, well done, congratulations. Mate, Phil. Anyway, now thank, thank you, Phil. It's been an absolute because pleasure. Because I have failed miserably. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. He's he's beaten some. Uh, who else did you beat, Cats? Um, was it Doctor? Doctor um, uh, oh, you beat Doctor. Uh, yeah, you beat Doctor Shinichi 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 Yeah, you beat Doctor yeah, Shimara. Shimara. That's um, it. It's Crash Course. We just don't yeah. know our history very well. Yeah, apparently. It's, that it's was fine. close. So we both had five minutes at the same time on that one. I remember. Oh, that. yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah, that was mm. very, that was very close. And then this you got close too. You got what by Robin Ince, who guest Einstein on the second clue. Uh, yeah, you, uh, I know you. Uh, Phil, I bet that was that's Rob, probably Robin Ince mm -hmm. guest Einstein on the fact that he studied at um, what was it Zurich Polytechnic. Oh, yeah, that. that's yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah got well, I would have known that. that's Einstein, too. Ah, well, there you go. Oh, See, cat's not good enough, yeah. mate. Uh, what was and, the first one? Um, the first one was bought when he was born, the year he was born. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, Actually, so I would have said Einstein right away. We're good. We're good. <laughs> Cats is free all. Well done, mate. Uh, but yeah, Phil, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Um, finding out about all the, all the bits and pieces you've been up to. Um, we can find you. Uh, you're on Twitter, aren't you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter as Bad Astronomer. Yep. Uh, Sci-fi.com, S-Y-F-Y is where my Bad Astronomy blog is. I Perfect. have a newsletter, badastronomy.substack.com. It's free on Mondays. Okay, we'll put all that in the description. Just type my name into Google. You'll find a million things. I've yep. been, been around for a while. And we'll link the uh, we'll link the Crash Course Astronomy in the, in the description as well. But thank you very much. We are done for this week. Next week, Cats, we've got Cody of Cody's Lab. Do you have watched Cody's Lab? I do, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, all he's, time, yeah. he's coming on next week, so uh, that should be good. But for now, Thanks. we're done. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yo!